Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Mark Smith with SIPL, wishing everyone a happy Data Privacy Day, um, which, of course, officially is January 28th, but that falls on a Sunday this year. So many are turning this into a Data Privacy Week starting today, and even a Data Privacy Fortnight continuing into next week as well. I know that, that we're doing that at SIPL, and... Um, and I hope you are too, because of course you can never get too much privacy, especially when you're a privacy nerd like me and possibly um, like my guests, you know, without dissing you before we begin. But Malachi, if you could move to the next slide here. I wanted to, um, to thank our guests who may or may not be privacy nerds, but they are definitely chief privacy officers from the three municipalities um, in the U.S. And, and it's... And I'm excited to talk about a topic that sometimes gets overlooked, which is uh, public sector privacy. So I'm, I'm thrilled we got a nice mix of cities today, all falling within the top 20 U.S. cities, in case you didn't know. I did some extensive research on Wikipedia before this and learned that all three of these cities uh, fall within the top 20. Um, Michael, I guess you guess, you could probably guess which is the most populous city in the U.S., uh, that would be New York. Welcome to Michael Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mark. Great to be here with you all today. And thank you for SIPL for, for hosting. Yeah, well, thank you for reaching out to us to, to do this. Uh, so it could be a little um, questionable which city would be the next biggest. Uh, Ginger uh, Armbruster from Seattle, I thought it would be you. I thought you would be a little bigger than than San Jose, but apparently not. But but welcome Ginger from San from Seattle, which ranks number eighteen according to Wikipedia. Oh, there you go, growing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, and I'm really excited to have this conversation today. Thank you, and and Albert San Jose is in the top twelve. Did you realize that that you're the twelfth largest city in the United States? 12th largest in the country and third largest in California. Oh, okay. Great, well, uh, I guess you've been to be here, everyone. To that Wikipedia page, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having us, Mark, and uh, great oh, to be sure. here. Sure. Um, just want to let everybody know that we're going to have an open discussion today, and we welcome input from the audience. Uh, so feel free to send us your questions via the chat function. And a reminder today that we are recording this um, uh, for your benefit and for sharing this later on if you'd like to. But before we get started, I wanted to give you a quick introduction about SIPL and how we were asked to moderate this discussion. So Malachi, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, SIPL, for those of you who don't know, stands for the Center for Information Policy Leadership. We're a think tank with offices in Washington, London, and Brussels. And we reside within the law firm of Hunt and Andrews Kurth but we're separate and apart from the law practice. Uh, we're supported by our member companies uh, from across the globe. And our goals are to promote good policy and best practices within the industry and to facilitate dialogue between industry and government policymakers and regulators. And so that's one of the things we're doing today, thanks to the representatives of these three esteemed cities. Next slide, please, Malachi. Ordinarily, we interact with national regulatory authorities, but this year, or I should say last year, 2023, we published a paper that discusses data privacy practices at a more granular level, principally with municipal governments, and specifically in the context of B2G or business to government data sharing. And when we were in the process of preparing this paper, we fortuitously met Mike Fitzpatrick at a conference last spring, uh, and uh, we we told them about what we were working on and that we were hoping to uh, address three principal questions. You know, what's the context of these government requests for data from businesses? Uh, what are the obligations that attach to data? And uh, how can the public and private sectors work together more harmoniously? And uh, David uh, or um, Mike participated in, uh, in a round table that we had with SIPL members and uh, helped helped us in the uh, formulation of this final 
white paper, which you can access on our website, which I believe all of you uh, received in your meeting invite. Uh, next slide, please. Our answer to the questions that we raised in the in the paper are are basically based on uh, SIPL's accountability framework, which is a risk based framework that provides assurance to government regulators and enforcement bodies that companies are identifying and prioritizing high risk data processing. And importantly, um, you know we we advise companies to be able to demonstrate their compliance. But accountability, of course, goes much beyond mere compliance uh, because we like to incentivize good data and security practices. Uh, next slide, please. So in applying those principles to the context of data sharing, our paper outlines 15 takeaways for accountable data sharing practices. And we produced this one pager uh, that summarizes those 15 takeaways. And uh, you, you should be able to download this for free from our website via the QR code. And I believe, Malachi, you will be um, sending a copy of this takeaway uh, after the meeting to, to register to attendees. So, so um, enough about SIPL. Let me move to, uh, you can get rid of the slides there, Malachi. But I just wanted to uh, give a little background about who we are and um, and how we were then invited when, when New York reached out to us to host this webinar for uh, Data Privacy Day. So I'm I'm thrilled that that you reached out to us, Mike, and, and your team, and uh, and that you were able to get Ginger and Albert on board with with this webinar. So let me start out with a question for all three of you, um, because I, I I believe the privacy officers within municipal governments are still somewhat rare. So you guys are, are rare birds to a degree. So can you briefly describe your journey and how you wound up where you are today and uh, and what experiences most prepared you for your current role? We'll start with you, Mike. Sure, thank, thank you, Mark. Um... So you know, to to kind of jump back to to your your frame at the at the beginning, um, you know, I've I kind of found uh, I I didn't embark upon my professional career um, with the privacy profession in in mind. Um, I would I would venture to say it's not traditional, but in my in my experience, I think non traditional is kind of the norm in terms of how folks find themselves within the privacy profession. Um, when I was uh, an undergraduate in, uh, in college, um, I was a finance major, um, thinking about going to law school, uh, first lawyer in my family, um, I ultimately made the decision to, to attend law school, um, but thought that I would be on a kind of corporate career path, even though I had absolutely no idea what corporate law was and still candidly don't really today. Um, you know, I got my start uh, as an as an intern, a legal intern with the New York City Police Department, um, which was uh, supposed to just last a summer. Um, but in the course of that that summer, I felt very much uh, pulled, uh, pulled into the world of, of public service. Um, the specific team that I was working with um, was a dedicated universe of attorneys who had the responsibility of advising uh, the department's uh, intelligence bureau personnel uh, who, ha who execute both uh, traditional complex criminal investigations through the department's uh, counterterrorism portfolio. Uh, that work also included uh, working with a long-standing federal consent decree uh, that NYPD um, works within known as the Hanshu Consent Decree, governing how the department conducts investigations of political activity. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but the, the world that I was operating in was really a first of its kind privacy uh, framework going back to the 1970s, um, outlining thresholds for uh, where uh, thresholds for fact that needed to be met in order for investigations to take place. Um, depending on the, the level of uh, the standard that's met, uh, the investigative techniques that are available, timeframes for those investigations, 
um, all things that you you hit notes of in I think and that we see um, across uh, privacy law uh, today. Uh, spent about 10 years with that group, um, then had the opportunity to become the NYPD's privacy officer, um, and then subsequently New York City's chief privacy officer. Uh, both the agency privacy officer role and the citywide privacy officer role are outgrowths of our local privacy law here in New York City, which been, has been in effect uh, since uh, its passage in, in 2017, which I, I know we'll, uh, we'll get into more, but don't want to hog the, the line from the rest of my panelists. Sorry. Uh, okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, so let me, let me move uh, to the West Coast there. Ginger, uh, how did you wind uh -huh. up in this role? I had a 20 year career in uh, technology sales and marketing, and then went back at mid-year career change, went back for a master's degree at the University of Washington, a master's in infrastructure planning and management. And I was part of the cyber core. I had a scholarship for service that landed me with an internship in the city of Seattle. Michael, I'm like you, I didn't leave. I, uh, I showed up for a six month internship and they tried to get me to leave. And I said, no, I'm staying, sorry about that. So unpaid at the time, um, I had a little bit of a stipend through the scholarship for service, but uh, that job, that role eventually because of a surveillance ordinance and a concern at the, at the resident level about the kinds of data that was being collected. And we had some technologies, including drones that were becoming interesting to, to uh, law enforcement, to public, uh, public safety. Um, needed and were asked by the mayor and our council to stand up a privacy program and they needed uh, someone enrolled to make that happen so that's what i did uh took a little couple years out to go to microsoft and find out about privacy um, practices in the private sector thinking i need to know what's coming and what's happening in the private sector and then came back as a chief privacy officer for the city uh, so uh, a lot of private background, but also our our main reason we are here is because of surveillance and technology and data collection from the public safety side and just general concern in our community. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into that um, further in the conversation, but let me turn to Albert and uh, and see how you found, found your way to this role in San Jose. Thank you, Mark. So I came to this role from a data science perspective. I worked as a data scientist for the city of San Jose prior to this. Um, and from there, we started asking questions around more responsible data practices. How are we processing information? To give you a little bit of geography of San Jose, uh, San Jose has got kind of a, you know, north, north half up here, which is where, uh, you know, north and west, where you can expect to see things like you're looking right at Apple's headquarters um, from City Hall, which is downtown. You can see Zoom headquarters, Adobe headquarters, right? you got these bastions of technology, right? And data collection, where data is a huge component of them. On the south and east side of San Jose, you're bordering things like Gilroy, which is famous for its garlic festival. And a lot of farm work, right? A... a high immigrant population, right? San Jose's immigrant, we're about 40% immigrant population. And so you've got this mix of some of the companies that are the most data intensive, along with some of the populations that are the most vulnerable to hyper data collection, really coexisting in this area. And that sort of necessitated the city to be a part of the conversation on how we are processing people's information. And back in 2018, uh, our, our council and a variety of folks from our city manager's side came together to start thinking through what do our privacy principles look like? How should we be processing data? That led to a policy in 2020, and that's around the time that they wanted someone to really take on this privacy officer role. And that's where I, uh, that's where I was brought on to really jump from a data science perspective to not just the data science and processing perspective, but also the... Uh, how are we taking care of our residents, right? How are we managing their information securely, responsibly, and in a way that they support? Okay, so it sounds like your role has already evolved you know, since you, you first joined with the city. Um, but so what are your primary responsibilities now? I'll, st I'll stick with you, Albert. Um, Mark, sorry, did you want me to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sticking with you. Awesome. So primary responsibility. So you've got, and I've seen this in, in a lot of privacy spaces, um, you've got this sort of middle arbiter sort of aesthetic to the role where I'm not exactly legal, but I work a lot with legal. 
Um, I'm not exactly cybersecurity, but I work a lot with cybersecurity. And I'm no longer exactly data analytics or AI, but I get pulled into those conversations all the time. Really, I think the role is about how do we make all of those conversations work in a way, like bring those folks together and just make sure that we are processing folks data responsibly and effectively, right? I'll just kind of, I can give you a, an example that we're working on right now is around say uh, translation, right? So you're processing translations in real time, super cool stuff that allows us for accessibility with our residents, but where does their translation data go? Does it stay within the city? How do we ensure that? How do we make sure that the translations are accurate? How do we make sure the translations aren't getting worse over time? Right. Those are all the types of conversations and ultimately just making sure that it's, you know, people know how to use it, know that it's an AI system. Right. All of those conversations from notice to security to use to to um, data access is really where I find the privacy role plays. Yeah, I, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about AI and how your um, role has evolved, obviously, into the AI space. But uh, let me let me check in with Ginger first and um, and see what what she sees her her primary responsibilities as now. Certainly, Albert Albert describes an environment very similar uh, to ours in Seattle with high tech, Microsoft, Amazon, all of those companies, and uh, high immigration and other folks here as well. And so the the uh, the the spectrum of issues that come up in front of us really kind of encompass data ethics, how we use data, how we share it, uh, how we participate in those conversations. AI has been the big one. I think every year there's something and that seems to be our thing. We talked about that when we were all meeting. So I have uh, grown in my, in my uh, responsibility uh, to include uh, data compliance around payment card information and other compliance regulatory frameworks. Privacy and surveillance are still the main part of, of our organization, but we also have public records and how we make it data available that's more around transparency and how we do that and open data. So data analytics in the sense of how do we support the data that people want to look at to make decisions about how we are handling and, and dealing with people's uh, information appropriately to make policy and, and other kinds of decisions. So I find that we get it pulled into data sharing conversations and that's how we find about big projects that we are helping align around privacy and around data retention, even though those, those aren't data retention isn't our specific responsibility, we find ourselves helping to advise. So I'm not a lawyer, but I have lawyer friends. I bring them into those conversations as well, Albert. That's what it feels like. And we become a little bit of a bridge on all these topics that really center around, I think, the ethics around data collection, use, security, all the rest of that. Uh, so it's a it's a very, it's a bridge position. And I find that my team members, when we first I took on all of those programs, how does this all work? Well, it all works around the regulatory, legal, and appropriate and commitments we make around data and how we process and use and make data available. So I think that's how it, it all goes together, that bridge role. Well, thank you. Well, Michael is a lawyer, right? But I'm sure you have other friends <laughs> who are lawyers within your team, right? So, uh, so what do you see as your primary role and responsibility? I've uh, I've got friends running the the full gambit of of, of those that both Albert and, and Ginger described. So I, I will I will second and, and third all of those. Um, so the the role of New York City's Chief Privacy Officer has uh, has been around since 2017 um, and is an outgrowth of our local privacy law, uh, known as the Identifying Information Law. Uh, this this law uh, within its gambit uh, exclusively applies to New York City agencies uh, and charges um, the role of the chief privacy officer with setting citywide privacy policy uh, for uh, city agencies, uh, as well as establishes um, a network or, or a requirement uh, that every New York City agency uh, have a privacy officer designated by their agency head. Um, our agency privacy officers fulfill a, a crucial role within uh, the framework of our local privacy law. Um, they are charged with evaluating um, the collections and disclosures of identifying information um, for their agency. Uh, and they also have the responsibility of preparing uh, required reporting from our local law on, on a periodic basis. 
um, that's really the the start of our story and the start of our office. Um, we've certainly evolved as well as as our other panelists uh, have indicated. Um, in 2022, uh, shortly after uh, Mayor Eric Adams took office, um, there was a recognition uh, that uh, the city needed a new, more holistic approach as uh, to technology services um, to deliver more effective and efficient outcomes for New Yorkers. Uh, my, my office had historically had a, a reporting structure that was not within the technology vertical. Um, and under uh, the leadership of Mayor Adams um, and Executive Order 3, after taking office, he created this new city agency known as the Office of Technology and Innovation, of which my office, the Office of Information Privacy, became a part uh, and put privacy within the same uh, umbrella as New York City Cyber Command, uh, which has the responsibility of uh, securing uh, the city's uh, IT assets as well as a number of different agencies um, in order to deliver those more effective outcomes, uh, reduce barriers to collaboration. Um, and and that of those evolutions continue uh, to this day from our involvement in the various work streams that we get engaged in from, from data sharing to platform development to AI governance and policy. Yeah, I put in the chat, I hope it's the correct link, <laughs> a link to your um your uh, privacy policies and protocols that uh, had your name on it. So it looked like it was one of your, one of your pieces of work. Yep, that, <laughs> can that's, you, that's yeah, us. Can you, so can you give a, um, get a little background on, on how you went about creating this document? And sure, absolutely. So uh, among the governance created by our local privacy law um, and, and charges to the chief privacy officer and setting citywide privacy policy um, is a, a biennial review that all New York City agencies conduct um, about their individual privacy policies um, and resulting in uh, a report that's ultimately sent to me uh, as well as to the mayor and uh, the New York City Council um, about what's ha what the pr those privacy policies are at those agencies. Um, this is, again, this is an exercise that occurs every two years. Um, that is not the end of our exercise. Uh, those reports are analyzed by my office um, to ensure that uh, the requirements of our local law are met, uh, and then referred to an entity within New York City government known as the Citywide Privacy Protection Committee, uh, which composition is defined by our local law, um, inclusive of uh, required agencies, as well as those that may be appointed by the mayor, the Citywide Privacy Protection Committee uh, reviews the entirety of those agency reports, which, which number north of 150, um, and provide recommendations to me as the Chief Privacy Officer on areas where they think po privacy policy can be enhanced and, and evolve. Um, those reports are submitted by the agencies uh, July of reporting years. Uh, the Citywide Privacy Protection Committee recommendations are, are sent that uh, immediately following October. Uh, and then the, city, the uh, Citywide Chief Privacy Officer has the responsibility of issuing those policies uh, early in the following calendar year. So we, we, we work on a very, very tight timeline, um, but we do have a, a holistic review and assessment of our privacy landscape every two years here in New York City. And what you've copied into the chat um, is the, uh, the manifestation of our most recent iteration. Uh, and we're in a compliance year. So stay tuned for, for our next updates uh, early in 2025. Okay, will do. What about, what about you, Ginger? What sort, of, uh, what sort of support are you getting from, from your mayor's office, uh, anything along those lines? Or? Yeah, it, we are smaller. I was looking at sizes of, uh, of or organization and operations. We have 13,000 employees, not 300,000. Is that right, Michael? You have a, a much larger scope. So we're responsible for uh, you know, training and policies 
citywide for, for all employees and departments. And we have, depending on the month, about 40 departments uh, across the city who then we work through a network of privacy uh, and data champions to help us understand the landscapes for each of those departments. But we're embedded in the Department of IT. So we rely on our chief technology officer. Our interim right now is uh, Jim Loader, uh, working with his uh, leadership up in the mayor's office to support our policies, our training initiative. We just launched our privacy training, security and privacy training today, and to make sure that we are working within the framework of what we are, what, what, what our leadership is looking for, what our uh, officials are looking for, what their initiatives and priorities are for the year. We also have an annual review of all policies that are citywide around data and around our uh, a memorandum of understanding between departments about how we operate and the compliance to the policies we put in place. Our most recent one was an AI, generative AI policy that goes through the rounds of all leadership as well as internal to IT to make sure that we're meeting the needs and the expectations of everyone uh, up and down uh, departments and, and in our, our hierarchy. But our job, I have 18 people uh, on my team for those four uh, those four programs I mentioned to you from open data all the way to privacy. And our job then is to work with, because it's all dotted lines, working with departments to make sure that they help them make, remain in compliance, provide education, training, uh, work with them when we have uh, apparent conflicts, that never happens, right guys? Conflicts with what our initiatives are, what people want to do and the, and the obligations that we have around data privacy and other regulatory requirements. So that is our job. We work with legal, we work with data retention, we work with finance, we work with leadership in, across departments, but we are the ones setting policy uh, direction around the critical areas that we need to be compliant with. Okay, thank you. Albert, mm -hmm. a similar setup in your neck of the woods? So our city, despite uh, having roughly a population of a million, uh, smaller than New York, but right right around the same size as Seattle, we've got about uh, 7,000 employees. And so what that leads to is a huge desire to try and supplement or streamline something with the use of technology. Um, I mean, everyone, everyone is shoestringed. That's just how it works in government. Um, San Jose, we're surrounded by a lot of this stuff. And so it, it, there's a, there's a big push to as much as we can automate, uh, do something of that sort. And so the way our framework is set up is we've got a centralized privacy office. So it's me and my, my team, along with a variety of, um, we'd basically call them our technology point books, our IT leadership team. Each of our departments, especially our major departments, has a representative. And that is how we communicate, disseminate information uh, from privacy to cybersecurity to you name it. All of that sits under our citywide privacy policy, which was passed in 2020, went into effect mid-2021, and that's right around the time that we got started. I want to echo basically everything that Ginger and Michael said. And one thing I'll I'll just add there that has been incredibly helpful on our end is San Jose has a centralized procurement system, which, you know, b benefits and drawbacks of that. But one of the things that has really helped us on the privacy side is that has meant that every procurement that goes through anytime that someone wants to purchase any technology of any kind, it reaches my desk. And that means that whether it be a printer or some type of fancy camera that's doing something with AI, I'm going to see it. And being able to triage those sorts of risks allows a high level of visibility on everything that's passing through our, our city. And that's really been incredibly helpful as we figure out, you know, uh, what's, what's the things that we should be focusing on? What are the things that we can just uh, let pass through? depending on that and all of our information on our on our privacy along with our ai governance which is fallen under our privacy office and we can talk more about that later um we we walk through all that on our uh web page okay which you just put in the chat there thank you yeah, exactly that. yeah yeah ginger i think you put something in the chat but not to everybody so i will put it to everyone i didn't yeah. want to clutter up our chat but i'm no, no, happy no, no, to do fine. that there you go that's fine but um so that 
other op other officers in other cities can learn from you? I mean, what sort of resources are available for municipal privacy officers out there? Is there some kind of organization, some kind of informal gathering? What, Ginger, you are, you got your mic off, so I'll start with you. Oh, what, certainly. What resources? Yeah, what resources could you could you share with folks? Um, before we do that, I, it, it is important to be, have a centralized IT. We, do, we are in, woven into the review process for new technology acquisition, and that's an important piece. For the federated folks out there, it's a little more complicated. But we are, we are a centralized entity like San Jose, and um, we do, I'm available anytime. Our, our team does a lot of um, work with other cities that are standing up programs or want to get some best practices. We can also tell you the stuff not to do uh, that wasn't so successful. But our uh, state privacy office, um, and I'll get a link and put it in the chat, uh, offers uh, a variety of resources for smaller municipalities who are on, the, on this early in this journey or aren't as resourced as we might be in the larger uh, cities. Um, to help folks. We do have meetings locally. We have meetings through a variety of organizations that help bring us together to have conversations about technologies and resources, policies, and best best practices. So we do participate in that as often as we can. I'm available anytime. So is my team for folks that would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But I believe that at the state level, they take as part of their remit to assist uh, cities that are looking to, to do this. And they look at best practices across the state and beyond. So that would be my my suggestion for folks. And I'll put a link here in just a minute. Okay, thank you. Let me put you on the spot then. What, what are some of the things that you would not recommend? You said uh, practices that you would <laughs> not recommend. Where did you try and, and fail? If you're allowed. Where do we try and fail? Let's see. I can say where we where we are most successful is where we bring people. What I like to tell my team is bring people along in the journey. We are not successful when we set a policy and expect people to follow it. People just don't work that way. We need to embed ourselves into review process. We need to tell people and bring them along in the journey of the importance of privacy until and the way I try to describe it to my team and to others is that each of these departments have a mission. A lot of them are very focused on public service and delivering services uh, to vulnerable members of our community. So coming up with just a policy and this is the law and go figure it out yourself is not an effective way of helping people understand the importance of data privacy. Rather, having conversations and consulting with them works. So um, anytime we try to say, oh, there's a policy, go read up on that, that's not effective. We haven't done that in a while. Re recognizing that people really need to understand, don't tell me no, tell me how, and tell me how in a way that is compliant. Most of the people we work with, just 99% of the folks out there are just trying to do the right thing, and they have a lot of pressures coming in about what that right thing looks like, especially if you happen to have an active uh, project that has the attention of maybe one of our elected officials. So, you know, a lot of media attention, a lot of political uh, pressure can apply to some programs, and so we work with and consult with departments, hopefully early in the process, because I think that's the other part. While we do have this oversight uh, uh, with new technologies that are acquired, nothing is worse than coming to the end of a project and having somebody stand up and say, yeah, by the way, we can't do that. Or this whole premise you have about data collection, that is not uh, according to our privacy principles. We can't, we can't do that. You need to get in there early and you need to get in there often. <laughs> and you need not to be part of a checklist. Oh, but I talked to the privacy guys. Well, that was the beginning of the project. We're here at the end and you've made a lot of changes or you've made technology choices that now limit our opportunities to make sure that we're meeting our commitments. So early, often, uh, and bring people along on the journey. Um, and it can be frustrating to be in a compliance role. It can be really frustrating because we feel strongly about privacy. We feel strongly about open data. We feel strongly about the programs we support. But, but feeling strongly about them, it also means you need to recognize the balance between business needs, needs to provide services, and what that might mean for data collection and use and even sharing. So being a part of that business decision and providing resource and being a valuable member of the team rather than the no, you can't do that is probably our best advice. Excellent. Yeah, I see uh, Albert and Mike will both nodding there. Do you have anything to add to that of what not to do or? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just quick add, right? Nobody, nobody likes someone stopping the party, right? Everyone likes someone who's adding value. And I think this goes for, for New York and Seattle as well. One of the biggest things on our mind is how do we make sure that the data that we collect does not end up investigating someone's immigration status. And whenever I bring up that conversation, it clicks for folks. People understand, oh yes, that is why we care about privacy. 
or we want to make sure that someone can't use the data we collect to say uh track a a victim of domestic violence especially the person who uh perpetrated uh that sort of domestic violence on them right all of those those are some of the biggest things that we talk about and that's where like ginger said being able to be a part of the conversation up front be constructive say you know let's not say no most of the time although sometimes you do but you know um say let's figure out what we can do of what you want like what you want is to be able to create a safer city and we all want that so let's figure out how to make people feel as safe as possible in this city using the resources that we have at our disposal and one last thing i'll add and ginger brought this up with the state right um there there are maybe 20 of these local privacy officers maybe maybe a few more now um across the country. And so there are these informal gatherings, there are these ways to connect and please feel free to reach out. Um, I think people will get uh, my email or others emails at the end of this. Um, we basically copied the vast majority of our privacy stuff from Santa Clara County, which is the, the county of that San Jose resides in. Um, and I invite others who are looking to get their start to do the same copy from us, copy from others this is the public sector uh you're not gonna take my market share if you uh if you take my stuff so please just take it put your name on it um maybe send me a thank you email if you can <laughs> okay well michael i i put your entire what is it 50 page document up there would you be encouraging folks to copy that yeah, I, I, I would, um, you know, I, I, before, before hitting that, I, I also just want to echo the points that both Albert and, and Ginger made about, um, meeting, meeting our clients where, where they are. Um, that is how I, and that is how our team approach, um, our advisory services on a, on a citywide basis. Um, we've got to understand the operational pressures, the operational perspective as best we can, um, and work within uh, those requirements, um, in addition to our privacy requirements uh, in, in executing, it's really changing the paradigm from a, from a, a no, but to a yes, if can make, make a heck of a lot of difference in terms of fostering that kind of collegial relationship and, and ultimate partnership. Uh, the, the other bit of news that I, that I wanted to share on that front in terms of, of modeling. Um, so yes, we, we've got the citywide privacy policies, which you've, uh, which you've dropped in the chat, Mark, and I very much appreciate it. Um, we, we've also made the, the determination and, and earlier today, in fact, um, announced and, and made our toolkit, um, which is available for agency privacy officers, uh, publicly available also on our page on the, OT, on the Office of Technology and Innovation uh, website. Um, that toolkit goes deeper um, than the privacy policies themselves um, it, with, with specific guidance to our agency privacy officers on how to handle specific cir circumstances, including uh, conducting a privacy-related investigation. Um, we think it's important um, that these resources not be uh, close hold. Um, we want them to be publicly available so that way other municipalities, if they are starting out, have the capability of, of adapting from um, and, and moving them forward uh, within the context of, of their particular requirements. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so we talked a bit about data privacy within the government and with among government agencies, you know, within city agencies. So I wanted to turn the conversation more towards data sharing um, with private sector businesses to the extent that you are um, looking for information from the private sector. Uh, Ginger, I'll start with you, if that's okay. So what sort of policies do you have in place? How, how are you handling these sorts of um, requests within CIA? So requests coming from departments who want to consume data from, from external from sources. Private industry, yeah. 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 Um, those are the conversations that get really interesting because uh, I don't know, I, we talked about this in, the, in our conversation, I didn't have a chance to look up public records law for, uh, for California and for New York. Ours is very, very liberal, meaning that we only have a handful, maybe two handfuls, maybe three uh, exemptions or redactions available to us for public records requests. So a lot of my concern around uh, 
about data, consuming data, is once we've consumed it, I can't protect it from a public records request that may have implications for immigration, for example, or for other uses we hadn't intended from, from members of the public. So a lot of the conversations we have around data sharing practice, and we do have uh, data sharing template language, and we have enter into conversations with departments who are doing that. When you marry the data up, remember it becomes a new record. That new record may be requested and available to anybody who, who asks for it. So that's really the, 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 what we focus on is how, how, what are you doing and how are you marrying it possibly with city records or others that may cause issues. Um, and we also, from other agencies, uh, get data. So for example, Washington State has data that is useful for a variety of applications, uh, Department of Licensing information, for example, or payroll information. Um, when we consume that information or enter into those data sharing agreements, we find there's an audit requirement. So we also advise folks on the fact that once you have this data in-house, you need to protect it and you may be answerable to the to the, to the original party who collected and made it available to you for your data security practices. And someone's gonna have to do that audit and someone's gonna have to pay for that audit. And someone's gonna have to be involved in that. Probably not my team. So there's a discussion around responsibility and accountability, but also what that means for larger requirements around transparency. I hope that answers your question. There is a real appetite for data right now. Our mayor, uh, Harold, is very, very interested in using data to drive policy and practice decisions throughout the city. So all departments, you just recently had a data, a data um, initiative that's gone public, the One Seattle Data Initiative, and I'll put it in the, uh, the link in just a moment so you can see what our strategy is for three years. But this will mean much more data internally and externally will be looked at to help drive those kind of policy decisions. And it means we just need to make sure people are aware of the obligations that come with it. I think one thing one thing I learned early in my life is that it's a lot easier to get into things than to get out of them. And public disclosure law really, really, really drives that point home. Once you got it, now I got it. Now I got to make it available uh, with my data retention anywhere from six months to 30 years. So I have an obligation to protect this data for the long, long, long life of that data cycle, life cycle. Um, so those are the things that we try to drive home. And we don't try to scare people. It's not the fear, uncertainty, and doubt principle when you go into those consultation meetings, but it is what is the full range of what you're trying to do? Please establish it. Do you need all that data? How much data do you really, really need? Um, let's let's try to minimize as much as possible so that our, our footprint is, is smaller, but also so that you're not just collecting data for the sake of it. And I will call out my city peers, we are we are pack rats when it comes to data. We have a really, really hard time not collecting it and a really hard time letting it go. And those are a part of our obligation. I hope that answers part of that. Oh yeah. No, you're 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 singing the, the simple song, so to speak, <laughs> with, <laughs> with you know specifying the purpose that you want and making sure that you're only collecting what you want to collect. Yeah. Um Albert, you got anything to add to that topic? Sure. So like Ginger's been seeing, there's a lot of value in potentially being able to buy data from the private sector. I'll give you an example, and we talked about this in our rehearsal a little bit, uh, parks. It's really valuable for our parks to know how many people are going to the parks so that they can then plan things like how often should they maintenance the bathroom? Should they add a new restroom? Should they add more equipment to certain parks? Like which ones are being serviced at what times? What are the open hours, right? These are all very basic questions that unless you had someone physically there just counting the number of people at all times, you wouldn't be able to know how many people are there. And that is something that we cannot afford to do. But what we can afford to do is buy data from an aggregator around where people's cell phone things are based on, you know, some cell, cell tower triangulation, things like that. Um, incredibly useful potential data, but it comes with this thing alongside it that now it looks like the government is tracking your cell phone data, right? And how do you balance that, right? Because like Ginger said, I don't need to know, you know, what's the actual purpose and how can I limit my data to what I actually need, right? I don't need to know each individual person where you are. I just need to know how many people were here. And in so many of the conversations that we have with the private sector around data, it, it's when the department brings me on, they try to bring up first like the technology or the vendor and all this stuff, yada, yada, yada. I, great, just first start with what you're trying to do. And then we can just make sure that everything lines up with that, right? Because in every conversation that I've had, basically no one needs to know where, uh, you know, 
one person is, right? No one needs to know where Albert is at this moment. They just need to know how many people are there or what's going on there in general. And those types of conversations, now all of a sudden, we don't need to store people's personal information from this data that we're purchasing, which really goes a long way in preventing the risk of whether it be a data breach, a public records acts request, right? If we lose track of this data, if it's aggregated, anonymized, pseudomized in some way that's reliable, all of a sudden there's a lot less risk and it still allows us to get the jobs done. Um, the last part around that is just communication with our residents, right? They need to know, we might know that it's aggregated data, we can't track someone. They also need to know that, right? And so it's about communicating proactively with our residents, making sure that they understand this is what we're actually getting and this is how we're using it before uh, we actually start using it, before it opens up the space for questions where all of a sudden people get worried that it's something different than it is. And how do you do that? I mean, how do you get that communication out beforehand? Great question. So I put a little bit of this um, in our chat already, that aggregate privacy page that I shared. Um, but probably the best place to go is just kind of taking a look at our public comment area. So we do a variety of engagement in our, especially in our three main languages, which are English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, that covers about, you know, 80, 90% of the languages spoken at home. Uh, we're working on getting Chinese accessibility in there as well. Um, we do in-person engagement, we do online engagement, and we do virtual engagement, like Zoom webinars like this. We especially target the areas where either A, folks are less likely to come down to City Hall and ask questions um, because they might not have access or it's too far from them. Um, they might have not have internet access or they might not uh, just have the time, right? So those are the areas that we target for in-person engagement. Um, we also have then citywide webinars, citywide uh, uh, meetings and events that we go to, basically just to tell people, look, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And this is what you can expect to see. And if you have concerns about it, great, tell us that so that we can then shape our policies in a way that meets our residents' needs. And it's been incredible having those conversations. I mean, we're having conversations with our residents that I, you know, many folks would define as our most vulnerable populations, right? The folks that might be at the most risk of deportation, the most risk of a lot of these surveillance issues. We, get, we sit down, we have these conversations with them, we explain to them the privacy protections that we have, we explain to them why we're doing this, why we're putting up, say, a camera or something here. And it's amazing on how the conversation shifts from, why are you putting this up? What is this doing? To, oh, I get it. Can you please put up a device here, here, and here, right? Because this corner street is where people drive like an absolute maniac. And this is where my kid walks to school and people take this right turn like it's a freeway. And, you know, and all of a sudden you start getting this incredible insight that frankly we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and this link I put in the chat is just an example of some of the comments that we get, right? Not only do we get information about how we should shape our policies and make sure it feel, makes everyone feel safe, but also where we should be putting this technology um, to get our, our biggest, you know, bang for buck, if you will, uh, to be able to provide the services that we need to to our community. And that just, I mean, that just really takes us to the next level in, in how uh, when departments see that, when, when our departments see the value that we're getting from that, it, it really, it really brings it home that, oh, this is something that we should be doing. Okay, thank you for that. Um, before I turn to Mike to uh, to get his thoughts on this topic, I'm going to remind people that if, if you have questions, uh, feel free to to put it in the chat. Or I believe um, you might be able to unmute. I'm double checking with Malachi on that. Uh, but uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Michael, and uh, see about how you're dealing with the uh, the public public private partnership in, in data sharing? Sure. Um, so from from our our perspective, um, our our local privacy law um, uh, operates in terms of uh, transactions, that is collections and and disclosures of identifying information. Um, identifying information is defined quite broadly as any information that's uh, that alone or in combination with other elements is capable of identifying identifying or locating a person. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the agency privacy officers that exist throughout New York City play a critical role in evaluating those collections and disclosures uh, on, on behalf of their agencies. Uh, by, by law, uh, that analysis is guided by um, a, a necessary consideration of the unique mission or purpose of the, each city agency as a consideration in addition to uh, underlying lawfulness. Um, those, those determinations that are made at the agency level uh, are, are reflected uh, within the biennial privacy reports that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, which are circulated uh, to, uh, among others, the city's legislative body um, and are publicly available uh, information. And additionally, um, we, uh, within the contract constructs of our local law um, and our citywide privacy policies um, and the toolkit that I mentioned earlier, um, have model terms uh, that we uh, advise from a, a contracting perspective, data sharing perspective, contractual perspective, um, that work within our operative framework, um, while of course uh, mitigating privacy risk uh, as best as uh, best possible. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to let the audience know again that we were coming down to our. Our last few minutes, if you have any questions you want to ask, um, raise your hand or stick the question in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask our panelists if you had 10 minutes. Oh, here's a raised hand. Okay. So Lawrence Hong, if uh, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Hi, I just want to mention that the chat is disabled. So uh, in case you're not aware, I'm sure that's a lot. Questions from well, that a lot of people. Why, yeah, are you able to receive the uh, the things that we placed in the chat? I am able to see that. Okay. okay. Yes, right. I, I I do have a question. Um, sure. sure. Uh, so that I'm not wasting the time. Um, now, Albert has uh, um, has mentioned about the uh, public comments uh, that will place on the website. How do you like like does your system mediate? Uh, content that are being put there? In the sense of, I, I think I see what you're getting at, right? Um, as of now, what we try to do throughout any of our public comments is we record them written, uh, we respond, we discuss, and they're there, right? Uh, they are the public comments. Um, that is the discussion that we're having. Um, what we have found, um, especially when we first started doing the engagements is folks from outside of the community would join in the conversation. And that is where you could end up with some issues, maybe people coming in with certain agendas. Um, but as we did more and more of the engagement that tended to die down and we really started focusing on the communities themselves. And frankly, if the community has a type of concern, it, it's important that we acknowledge that, um, Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for your question, Lars. Um, I, I do have one more, if, if, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, when you receive those comments, can can um, the general public uh, remain anonymous? Uh, do you? Absolutely. The second question is: Do you verify, like, if oh, okay, well, this person it seems like it's the same person, but like using different names and then trying to. Uh, create a concern in the city kind of thing like what, what kind of protocol uh, do you have uh, in your in your, in your, in your program policies yes uh, absolutely so comments can always be anonymous um, and as we do in person engagements the verification that they're in the city or that they're a resident is pretty straightforward they're at their neighborhood association meeting uh, when it comes to anonymous comments that we get on the internet um, in our publicly accessible public comment page. No, we we don't know. I mean, it's similar in the same way to any uh, city council meeting. If someone calls in, we don't exactly know where they are, but there's, you know, it's, it's a balance between the comments that we get from them. You can usually tell if it's someone just from outside or trying to sell you something versus someone who's actually a resident. And it's important to note that this is 
it's a common, it's a directional common. It's important for us to take those, interpret those and build the case from a bunch of them on how to make decisions. It's not simply a single comment is all of a sudden going to shift our entire direction. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Lawrence. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I just wanted to give each of you a chance to to drive one point home. If uh, if somebody said, hey, I, I listened to this great webinar today, and the one thing that, that I got out of this from Seattle, San Jose, and New York is, okay, so I started with Seattle. Ginger, I'm putting you on the spot. What's the one takeaway that you want attendees that I, yeah, that I th I think the conversation about privacy is one that encompasses so many different interests and perspectives that it is important, as Albert and I think Michael, my colleagues have pointed out, to continue the conversation. We can set some priorities. We can look at the direction of the uh, of where privacy policy is going. We can talk to other cities, but it is really important on the ground to have conversations within your own group of departments, your own colleagues and your own municipality and with the residents of your community to find where the most important part of this policy or what, what you're trying to do lives. For the city uh, of Seattle, privacy was, was really galvanized by uh, concerns about surveillance. And I think if you go to any one city, you'll find privacy has a slightly different flavor of what that is. Down in Portland, it's around equity. Um, different cities, for example, have different initiatives, different reasons that privacy became important. And it's important to, to, to make sure you're channeling that uh, and helping grow the concern around how data is used in a way that is uh, uh, effective and useful for the community. Um, and you can't do that in your own. Can't end that in the privacy of your own office. So hopefully we can provide tools about what worked in our community and then use that as, an, as, a, as a springboard to find out what works in yours and what is important and what are the things that, the where should that conversation be going? Because it's not a one-way conversation. It needs to be a two-way. I hope that's helpful. Oh, very good. Yeah. And I should say to, to each of you, if you wouldn't mind, if you're willing to receive emails from people, just stick your your email address in the chat, and then people can reach out to you. Mike, how about you? What's the uh, one takeaway you'd like? Folks sure, to uh, uh, abs absolutely, and, and and it's really echoing Ginger. You know, and if if I had to um, to put it into one word, it's it's partnership. I think what you've seen throughout um, the duration of this call um, has been um, across government services from a municipal perspective, you're seeing privacy governance implemented in a way um, that is not operating in a silo, uh, that is cutting across uh, not just uh, agencies, uh, which have their own roles and responsibilities, um, but functions of, of, uh, of uh, professional services like IT, information security, uh, policy, policy development. Um, and, I, and I think you also see uh, within that lens of partnership, uh, the, the role of the public um, that across each of these municipalities, uh, a foundational element of privacy governance um, is, is providing information uh, and making information available to the public about how uh, their, uh, their local government is, is operating um, with their privacy in mind. Thank you. Albert, you get the last word. Thank you, Martin. Thank you again, everyone, for being a part of this conversation. Uh, I thought I was going to come in with a unique final take, but it's clearly uh, the same as everyone else. Uh, come together. Come together with folks here in two ways. Bring your residents along for the innovation that you're trying to do, one. And two, come along for the ride that we as governments are all trying to navigate. I'll just give an example here as we're all trying to navigate AI, one of the great things that we're actually doing with Seattle, with New York, and a bunch of other cities, agencies, counties, uh, state agencies, is trying to figure out how do we govern AI? How do we hold vendors account accountable? How do we take what we've done great around privacy um, and apply it to this new element, this new flavor on top? Um, really just join us, talk with us, uh, copy, paste, uh, and, uh, do better, do better than us so that we can copy you. Excellent, excellent. Very, 
great, great words to, to end this webinar on. I want to thank all three of you for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to speak with you and uh, get a chance to share and hear from you and, and all of your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have, have a good a day.